Well, it is good to see you here. I don't know about you guys, but I look forward to this day all week long. Uh, probably because I don't get to see very much of you throughout the week. Uh, so I really do look forward to seeing you all at once. Uh, all in one room, right? Uh, we are going through Galatians, the book of Galatians. Uh, we are finishing up, uh, very close to finishing. Uh, and as we have done for every week leading up to this, we, we remind each other of, of this theme that we've had uh, throughout uh, the many weeks of reading through Galatians, discussing uh, what Paul has to say. And, and that theme tells us that the gospel of Jesus Christ creates a, a new, in, in Paul's words now, a new multi-ethnic family of God. And that family of God is truly transformed by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. And we've been talking over and over about this multi-ethnicity uh, because all of a sudden now thrust upon the world is this God who was the God of Israel and the God of the Jews and is now also the God of the Gentiles, everybody else in the world, not just the Jews. So this multi-ethnic, not one group of people better than others, we are all equal, coming to the cross as humans, brothers, sisters, sinners. Last week we heard the Apostle Paul talk about our obligation to bear one another's burdens, to carry, to support, to take on whatever synonym we want to use. And that when we see a brother or sister <coughs> in sin, we should restore them gently. I know some of us as Christians would like to restore with a two-by-four. Because I think everybody in here and who has ever been adult, an adult has had someone in their life along the way who just doesn't get things no matter how many times you tell them and you just would like to educate them with a swift swing, right? Charlotte's right on top of that. Are some of them sitting here? Okay. Charlotte's not afraid. Okay. But Paul says, and Scripture says, uh, it, it is our obligation as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, that especially when brothers and sisters within the church, when they are doing things that are counter to Jesus' teaching, when they're doing things that are counter to, to Scripture, that we would say, man, that just doesn't seem right. Uh, it is our obligation as disciples of Jesus to restore those people gently. We don't bash them with Bibles, no matter how much we really would love to. <laughs> if you could hear Charlotte, you know, she just kind of went like that. Uh, no, we walk alongside them because in the midst of that same passage we said we bear one another's burdens. We take on. When, when that person is struggling, we're struggling. Okay. When that person is hurt, we're hurt. We take on the burdens. We take on that because we can't do this alone. We have to do this in community. So we restore each other gently. And we pray that as we do that, that day, that fateful day, I know some of you have never been there yet. But that fateful day when you need someone to restore you gently or give you a good swift swing, you pray, you pray that you have someone who would just step into life next to you and walk alongside you and say, I get it. And I'm right here with you. And, and together we're going to do this. And all things are possible through him who gives us strength. So we're going to face this together. You are not alone. We're going we're gonna to have God restore us to His original design for what humanity should be. And He's going to do it gently and with love and mercy. Uh, if you take your devices or your Bible uh, to the, and turn to Galatians chapter 6, this is where our reading is today, Galatians chapter 6. And I'm starting at, at verse 6 and only going to verse 10. Uh, next week we'll finish up the whole letter. Uh, we'll have a, a kind of a summation of it. We'll probably have, even have a party and say, yay, we're done with Galatians. Because you guys are ready to be done with Galatians, right? Some of y'all need to wake up this morning. i got to tell you, maybe we need some coffee pastor or something. 
Galatians chapter 6, reading at verse 6, it says this, Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the Word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot, will not, be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we would say God's time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for these words, these verses that we get to discuss today. And we pray, God, again, that as we talk about them, as we chew on them, as we even leave this place and chew on them some more, God, would you have your Holy Spirit speak your truth into our hearts and minds so that in the processing of this information, we will be restored to your design, that journey of sanctification. God, we pray that you would set us apart, help us to learn your truth, and then put action to that truth in our hearts and minds. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So a question for you, and it's a loaded question. Should pastors get anything for what they do? Oh, boy. Okay, yeah, yeah. So when, when, I'm, when I was researching for this, uh, this passage, this message, okay, you would not believe, okay, because you can go online and you can find sermons from just about any church. I mean, any church in the world today, especially in the United States, has technology and you can watch on any given Sunday whatever pastor you would like to watch and you can hear what they have to say on a specific set of verses, Right? And a lot of those pastors put their manuscripts, uh, their sermons online so that other people could use them if they need, or to just check, you know, research, say, what does this person say? What does that person say? Okay. And on, as I'm researching this passage from 6 to 10 in Galatians chapter 6, I want to tell you that about 95, 97% of sermons that I found and watched and, and read and whatever just completely skips over verse 6. Like it's not even there. Okay, They run from 1 to 5, and then from 7 to 10. Because pastors don't like getting up and talking about themselves. Just like you guys. You guys probably don't like getting up and talking about yourself either. Okay, So for whatever reason, this little line, nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the Word should share all good things with their instructor. Pastors don't go over this. It's in the same section where, where Paul's talking to Timothy about how a pastor or a preacher should be taken care of by their church. Okay, And pastors don't preach sermons on those either. Because we don't want to seem like we're self-serving. We don't want to seem like, hey, give me a raise. Okay? We, we don't want to seem like that at all. Should pastors get anything for what they do? Maybe the better question is, do you understand what a pastor actually does? Uh, the, the, the list, the litany of all the things that they do. And i got to tell you, if some of you say, yeah, I know exactly what you do, you don't. I didn't know until I was actually doing it. Okay, And even when you come to a place like Pasconess, I thought I knew because I'd served in multiple other churches, but when you get to Pasconess, they say, no, 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 no. He didn't tell you everything when you interviewed. There's some other undisclosed stuff, you know. Some of you board members know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, And you find out along the way that your job just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you know. Pastors get anything. I think most pastors gloss over this verse, and and they get to the meat of the passage in verse 9, which says, don't get tired of doing good. You know, do good to all people in verse 10. Yes, that's a great warm, fuzzy passage of verses. Maybe pastors don't like talking about what they should earn or how they should be taken care of by those that they instruct or lead. It's a hard subject, of course, but we haven't skipped around in our study yet, so why start now? We've gone from verse to verse to verse. So, 
Nevertheless, verse 6, starting off right there. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction, that's you, in the word, should share all good things with their instructor. That would be me. You, you know, for the people who have been here for a while and have heard me talk, uh, you know how much I love absolutes when we use absolutes, right? I don't, because none of us as humans can really speak in absolutes, because there's always something that disproves it, right? But when Scripture uses absolutes, when God uses absolutes, we ought to pay attention. Now, i got to tell you, when Scripture says that you should share all good things with me, I'm going to take that absolute. You should share all good things with me. The instructor, right? Paul starts off this section with this clear command, which I have to tell you a great many Christians just simply ignore. Okay, Whether it's because of ignorance, because they haven't been taught this yet, or they haven't read that section of Scripture yet, or, or whatever. Uh, maybe it's because they have a weak pastor who isn't willing to preach on those verses. Okay, They just skip over it completely. Uh, or through their own selfishness or through their personal faith issues on finances. A majority of people who go to church just don't tithe. Well, that's a whole other subject altogether. That's really kind of how you support the church and support the pastor, right? Right? Tithe is for God, but it also goes to the work of the church. It pays the bills of the church. It pays the people who work at the church. It helps us so that we can do ministry all over the place whether it be in Africa or right here in Pasco. It's how I support my family. I have joked with some of you before about these examples of tithe and, and even this passage where it says that you're to share all good things with me. Okay. Like if you entered a drawing and you won a weekend in Seattle, with a hotel and parking and luxury suite to the Seahawks game today. You should share all good things with me. If you got two tickets, I get one of them. My wife doesn't like the Seahawks. She's a Cowboys fan. She doesn't need to go. I will gladly go with you because Scripture says you share all good things with me, right? The one who does the instructing. Just like we talked about last week, when we see a, a brother or sister uh, in difficulty and sin, we have an obligation to restore them gently. Now Paul's saying the same thing about how we ought to support the church and the pastors, the ones who receive instruction in the Word, the ones who receive support from the church, the ones who are growing because of the work of the church, the ministry of the church. They, we, have an obligation to share all good things with the instructor. When you grow because of things I've said or done, God working through me, then God, give the good things you have so that I can continue the work of growing disciples and meeting needs. It's a big cycle, right? We've talked about the cycle of generosity and tithe. That kind of ties in right here. But i got to tell you this morning, I, I'm just going to be super open and honest with you guys and say that most of what pastors get is negative. I just want to take a moment and let you in on the, the inside brain of a pastor, okay? Most of what pastors get is, is negative, not, and very much of it not by choice, okay? And by that I mean it's not your choice that you're just always giving pastors negativity. The vast majority of the time when we get to spend time with you the most is when one of your loved ones has passed away. That's the vast majority of the time. That's when we need a pastor. We need someone to kind of counsel us through this. We need someone to do the funeral, of course. We need someone who's going to tell us it's going to be all right. Or maybe it's not the loss of a family member. Maybe it's just, man, uh, you're struggling with addictions or you're struggling with marriage or you're struggling with all these, all these things. And the pastor's who you go and talk to. I mean, people like me, I got a degree in counseling. That's, that's, you go talk to that person because they have some skills, they have some knowledge. And they can help you get through stuff. But what that is, 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 man, it's just brokenness. It's negativity. And pastors 
we get a lot of that. We deal with, with broken people and broken families and sometimes in the very worst of times. And we're just one person, on a flip side, we're one person often attempting to please a group of a hundred people or more who all have their own likes and dislikes. It's a very tough job. So what are the good things that you are to share with your pastor? I would be the first to tell you that uh, I can't speak for every pastor, but I've talked to a lot of pastors about this. When we get together, this is one of the subjects we talk about. You know, what do you wish your congregation was, was doing to help you, to support you? How, how would things get better? How would they be made better? So again, on the inside of the brain of a pastor, you guys just get this morning this little this little interior look. What are the good things that you are to share with your pastor? I think the vast majority of, of people within the church or even outside the church, if they were asked that question, what, what, if, what, what are the good things that you should do for your pastor? What are the good things that you should share with your pastor? Uh, most everybody says money. Because that's often how we take care of situations, Right? If, if we have situations, it's money that fixes it. If we have a broken appliance, it's money that fixes it, right? We either get a new one or we get someone who knows what they're doing and they fix it. Money, tithe support to the church, gifts. But just for a few minutes, I want to share with you what every pastor would, what I think, tell you about what they would like, the good things that you would share. The big thing is that money isn't that big of a deal. Yes, pastors have to talk about money because we have churches that need to do ministry. We have bills that need to be paid. We have all those things. That's just kind of the business side of church. But money isn't that big of a deal. It really isn't. One of my favorite uh, Christian singers who died way too young, Keith Green, wrote a song based on King Saul, called to, be, to obey is better to, than sacrifice. Okay? And in that, he is singing from the perspective of God, and he says, I don't want your money. I want your life. To obey is better than sacrifice. Yes, God asked. He, he outright asked, give me a tenth, give me a tithe. Well, God really wants. What Jesus said when he came to, in the New Testament was, it's not even 10%, but it's everything. It's 100%. So maybe the first thing would be, it's not what you think it is. It's a good thing. Now, don't get me wrong. I would love to go see the Seahawks in the luxury box and have an all-expense-paid weekend with Mike or somebody, you know, anybody, Tim. Okay? That would be sweet. But I'm not expecting it. The good things that every pastor would like to receive, I think the first one would simply be time. Time. I mean, if you think about it with your own family, your own spouse, your own relationships, the most valuable thing someone can give is their time with you. Right? Most pastors would love to spend more time with their congregants, with their parishioners, however you want to say it, with the people that they are involved in ministry with. But the caveat would be if you would let them. Because most of us, we come to church and we go to the service and then Zoom, we're out because we got to go have some lunch somewhere. we got other things to do. And then for the rest of the week, we don't see that pastor again until the next Sunday when we see them. And, and i got to tell you, every pastor, man, he would or she would love to just spend more time with you. The culture has changed from the time when you could knock on someone's door Papa Dan was in active ministry. You could go call on people and say, I'm the pastor of the church right down the street. I just wanted to check in with you. And you could start a conversation, and they would even invite you into their house. But not today. Most people don't want you coming to their house, right? Even people that I've known for years in the church, they don't want me coming to their house. They don't want me to see how they live. I mean, it might not be up to standard, right? 
They might not be quite clean enough. Most pastors find it very difficult to make appointments with people in their churches just to talk. Time. And pastors, we know that you are very busy with your work and families and schedules and life, and, and so are we. We have families and schedules and lives. And we are burdened with watching so many of our congregants drift away from the church due to the splitting of their time between all these things and the church. So maybe the first thing I would encourage you, that if you would read this verse and you would say, I want to share some good things with my pastor. Spend time. I think the second thing would be uh, talents. Pastors would love if you would put your talents in with your time, the things that God has gifted you to do, the things that you are really good at. Okay, uh, The church needs people who are talented, who are gifted in things like leadership and administration and teaching and people who are lifelong learners that just can't soak up enough information. And, and we need people who are artistic, who can design things, creative people, dreamers. We need plumbers and electricians and construction people who know how to do things. Or even people who can simply just see humanity in any other person. You can just see someone that God loves. There are lots of talents that the church needs, and unfortunately most of us pastors, uh, we're good at maybe one or two of these things, but we're not good at all. And the role in the, of the pastors in the church, and, and I don't know whether it was Papa Dan's generation or the generation before that or whatever, but we had the church for a while where the pastor was the end-all, be-all, and they were the authority, and they... They couldn't do anything wrong, and they knew how to do everything, and i got to tell you, they didn't. They had a lot of pressure put on them, an expectation put on them, but they couldn't. And, and now, they're still there. There are lots of talents that the church needs. You are needed in the church. And whether you're an administrator or a finance person or you're a creative dreamer when it comes to logos and designs and, and color schemes for walls and carpets and things like that, or you're just an encourager, or you're someone who can see humanity in anyone, we need you. So, time. Spend time with us. Talents. Share your talents. Number three is presence. Time, talents, presence. Pastors would love if you could be present consistently. Because here's the deal, folks. We have over 140 people that attend this church. They just don't ever attend on the same Sunday. I'm, I'm serious. If we go down our roles... Okay, our, our list of people who come here on a, on a fairly consistent basis. We have over 140 people. They just never show up on the same Sunday. I've said it before uh, that the average regular church attender in the United States now goes once every six weeks or so. That's where we're at now within the church. doesn't matter the denomination, okay? That's where we're at in the church now for regular attendance. We have to stretch it out there because if we did less than that, boy, you won't want to know the statistic of how many people regularly go to church. But if we, we stretch it out to once every six weeks, we can make the numbers look pretty okay. This means that this being my 13th sermon on Galatians, an average attender may have caught two of them, maybe. And we have quite a few members, i got to tell you. We have quite a few members and families and individuals in our church who have done this very thing or less. Some of you could probably name them because you know they haven't, they haven't been here. They, they pop in every now and then when time allows. And if you don't know who they are, 
well, we've got another problem altogether. Be present means a lot to us. When you spend your time with us and with the church, when you invest your talents in service to God, when you're present. The last one I would tell you is probably the most difficult one for pastors, but every single pastor I've talked to that I know, this would be the number one thing on their list. And it's so important that I saved it to last. And that's friendship. Friendship and encouragement and support. Approximately 250 pastors in the United States leave the ministry every month. And one of the key identifiers of this is that they feel isolated, alone, and they don't have any Most pastors have few, if any, friends. Relationships are very hard when you are a pastor. Now you're even deeper into a pastor's journey. Relationships are really hard when you're a pastor. Because you can't ever just be you. It's really hard for people to separate the vocation from the man or the woman. People are friendly to pastors. All of you are very friendly to me. I got no complaints. But in this job as a pastor, having actual, meaningful friendships is nearly impossible. Not because we don't want them. Pastors crave them. They need them. They covet them because we are all designed for relationships. But I think it's too hard, again, for people to separate the person from the vocation and have true friendships, uh, honest relationships, authentic relationships with a pastor. See, we're on call 24-7, and we're thought to be never separate from that call. But we are. We have families just like you guys do. I have days off. At least I try. Many of you know, you've heard me say over and over again, man, Friday's my Sabbath. Sunday's not my Sabbath. I'm working all day Sunday. Friday is my Sabbath. It's my day when I just sit. And when my kids are at school, for that eight hours that they're at school, I'm in, I'm in quiet. And I just sit. And I sometimes I rest. I sleep. I'm trying to catch up, you know. And sometimes I just sit and meditate, or I may go for a, a motorcycle ride, or I may go for a hike up on the hill, or, or whatever. And I just, I try to let... God just pour into me to just be still. But even then, I'm, I'm kind of doing my job. I can't be certain why it is so hard for pastors to have friends either inside or outside the church, but I can say what I think it is. I can say what all my pastor friends, when we get together and we talk about these things, what they all think it is. It's all kind of the same. I think for people outside the church, and, and maybe you've heard me say this before, I, I tend not to introduce myself as a pastor. Because for people outside the church, as soon as they find out that you are a pastor, a wall goes up, and sometimes it's a physical, actual wall. Like they cross their arms and they take a step backwards. And sometimes you can just see it on their face. Because already they have going in their head, all this guy wants is money from me, and he wants me to come go to his church. He doesn't really like me. He doesn't want me. Maybe that's their perception. Maybe that I don't want to be friends with them. I just want their money and their attendance. I try really hard with that. People outside of the church, I get them. They are so confused about church and Christians. They don't know what to believe. Okay? Because what you see on the news is not what your neighbor, you know your neighbor goes to church and they or anything like that on the news, but they say that's Christian. Amplify that a little bit and you might know what it's like to be a pastor in this world. But people on the inside of the church, I, I don't get. I mean, we spend a lot of our time together, right? 
people around my age, maybe I'll just identify, you know, bring it down to a little bit. People around my age that I would, would hope to be friends and have, have relationships with and, and all that. The pastor's perception is that we mostly don't have friends inside the church because most people don't really want their pastor around. They don't want their pastor to know what they're doing when they're outside the church. You know, it's plain as day, because if you have social media, we know what you're doing. We know how you treat people. We know what your favorite things are. We know we know just pretty much anything about you. If you use social media at all, we got it. Okay? Maybe it's that they don't want to have to deal with the pastor always being there, having something to say about what they're saying and what they're doing. And i got to tell you, this is certainly true for my kids. They get that just as much as I do. But folks, i got to tell you, as a pastor, I need your encouragement. I need your support. I need your friendship. Not just spiritual friendship. See, it's vital to me as a person because I was designed for relationship, and just like you were designed for relationship, and it's vital to the success of my ministry because God has called me to do this, and I feel like I'm not connected with anyone. It's really hard to do. gives me energy to charge into battle every day when I know I have support and encouragement and friends. So now that you've had this, this brief little moment in the brain and emotions of a pastor on that, that verse that probably most pastors wouldn't preach about, I would tell you that if you're going to read this verse, verse 6, in chapter 6 of Galatians, and you're going to hold on to the uh, this important verse and something that you would actually do or invest in and give to God his tithe and your life. And in the following this verse, know that I need your time, your talent, your presence, your friendship. Just moving on to the last few verses of our reading today. Verse 7 through 8 simply says, don't be deceived. He says, you know, yes, the instructor needs all the good things. And he really likes coconut cream pie and Seahawks tickets. Just saying. Uh, sushi. Oh, yeah. And coffee gift cards. But don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Whoever sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. To me, this says God won't have people turning their noses up at Him. That God doesn't like it when people hear the Word and speak the Word but don't live the Word. It doesn't mean that God is going to take vengeance on those who turn their noses up at Him or who pretend they can do what they like and get away with it, even though they profess to be a disciple of Christ. It doesn't mean that he's just going to, you know, squish you. I always love that little image because I'm like an ant when it comes to God, and really he could just go, squish you. To me, it means that our behavior functions like farming. You are a fruit tree, not a Christmas tree. You are a fruit tree designed to do specific things. God has said that if you sow barley, barley is what you will get. And if you sow weeds, weeds is what you will get. If you sow negativity, then negativity is what you're going to get. Right? So if you sow to the flesh, the things of this world, putting your resources on the numerous pleasures of ordinary life, then all you have to show for it will eventually just be dust. Rot and decay. Because in the end, all the things of this world will pass away. Fine houses will eventually fall down. Splendid clothes will wear out. You 
we can go on and on, but all the things of this world cannot come with you when Jesus comes back. Only you. Only the people around you. But if you as a family member of this church sow spiritual things by giving solid and practical support to the ministry of God, especially in time, talents, and, and presence, then the Holy Spirit of God will grow fruits in you. It will bud out of you. We've talked about this a couple weeks ago. You don't have to have these things hung on you like a Christmas tree. When you follow after God and you are in step with the Holy Spirit, He grows you. And things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control start oozing out of you because there's nowhere else for them to go. The Holy Spirit has filled you up and they start blossoming in ways that you would have never imagined. The ministry of the Gospel builds people up. It encourages them. It builds community and unity and the life that comes from it will outlast death itself. Would you agree with that? The life that comes from the Holy Spirit will outlast death itself. We close with this very positive reminder for us all. Verse 9 and 10, Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. As you have opportunity, i got to tell you, folks, you have opportunity every single day. You get out of bed in the morning, you pull the covers back, you put your feet on the ground, you breathe in God's grace. You have life in your lungs for another day. And He's giving you an opportunity to breathe life into someone else. Do good to what? All. There's that out spot. All people, not just the ones that look like us or sound like us, not just the ones that we like, all people, everyone, anybody, the masses, the populace, the them, the they, however you want to say it. Paul is clear, almost as clear as Jesus when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, neighbor, Plasian, we have said this so many times, anybody else regardless of race, creed religion. Anybody. Do good to them. And then, and then Paul, although he doesn't have to, because all people should be clear enough for us to understand, Paul says, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And i got to tell you folks, we've got a lot of work to do. In being and doing good to our brothers and sisters. We disagree a lot in our church, don't we? Now we say we do it out of love, right? But we got political disagreements. We got lots of disagreements. And sometimes the words that flow out of them, even to our brothers and sisters who've been attending Pastor Nass with us for so many years, they just aren't good. Do good as the opportunity presents itself to all people. Why? Why would Paul give us this identifier? Because Paul knows the church. He's witnessing it firsthand. He's witnessing the division between the Jewish Christians and the Galatian Christians. He's witnessing all the rules and the regulations and, and the dissension with each other. And he's reminding them and us that when God presents you the opportunity, you're to do good to all people. Do good to your brothers and sisters here. Do good to your instructor, your pastor. Do good to all people. And don't become weary in doing it. This is life-giving. I, I tell you guys, we ought to be the most joy-filled, opt or optimistic people on the planet because we know the end of the story. Because we have Jesus. But we get weary in doing good things. Don't we? we get weary because it seems like we're not even making a difference. We get weary because too many people are confused about who Christians are and what they stand for because so many of them are so different. We get weary. Don't get weary. 
This is our call as disciples of Jesus, to bring light to the dark, to do good to all people, to support the church, our brothers and sisters, and to encourage those who bring the gospel message to others. So my question for you today is, what are you investing your resources in? It's good to have stuff. I don't want you guys to misunderstand me. I said earlier, you know, fine houses will fall down and lenders' clothes will turn to dust. It's okay to have clothes. We want you to wear clothes. Everybody does. It's okay to have houses. All these things that we're blessed with, though, are opportunities to serve God. That house is a place that can offer shelter to other people. All the stuff in that house for most of us, which is easily replaceable, I mean, if we had a couch that got a little tear in it, maybe we don't want that couch anymore, it's either going to go to the dump or Goodwill or whatever, because we want a couch that doesn't have a tear in it. Most of us, we can replace stuff, right? All that stuff, that, that stuff's God. Somebody says, man, I need a couch. I, I just got my first place, and I, I don't have anything in it, and I don't really have the money right now to do it. But ding, you've got a whole church full of people. And if they all gathered together, they could probably fill that apartment, that house, with everything they needed. Because it's all God's stuff anyway, right? What are you sowing daily? What are you planting in the ground hoping to reap? Is it discord? Is it negativity? And if I could, I would tell every single one of you, stop watching me. Stop watching the news. It's good to be informed. We need to be informed. But i got to tell you, folks, the news in our world today just speaks to plant division and negativity and discord. So we just fight each other over how we interpret the news. Stop watching the news. What are you sowing? Are you sowing good things? Are you planting God's Word in your heart? Yesterday uh, I put on Facebook, uh, I told our, our quiz team, hey, if you memorize this many verses and you come to quiz practice uh, today, yesterday, and you present to me some verses, if you come, I will get you whatever Dutch Brothers drink you want. Because I'm not above bribing our teams to memorize Scripture. Because I know that in the memorization of Scripture, God's Word is being planted in them, whether they are doing it for our Dutch Brothers or for life. They're going to remember that memorized verse. They're going to remember the meat of it. And so every single one of them came, and they, they all presented their, their memorization verses, and, and they all got a Dutch Brothers tree. And I presented that, that picture of, of, here it is. What are you sowing? Well, yesterday, man, I had every intent to get our team to sow God's Word into their life. So I planted something. I'll give you a reward. And they love Dutch Brothers. They like energy drinks. They like coffee. I don't, you know, they love it. Okay? And again, I'm not above bribery. And at the beginning of that, you know, so Kevin work, starts working with the teams, and they're doing their jump practice, and they're do, answering questions and everything. And I take off to the Dutch Brothers to go get their drinks, and I come back, and uh, they were doing pretty good. You know, it's you know, we're coming up to our first quiz meet. So they're just trying to get back into the swing of things and jump in, answering questions, studying all those things. And they're doing pretty good. And, and we kind of got this discussion going about, man, if, if they could all quiz out, that means answering four questions right in one round. Now, there's only 20 questions in each round, and there's four of them on a team. So that would be 16 questions, right? With only four left to, make, to have an error on or to just not answer because you didn't. Man, and if you guys could do that, if the four of you could quiz out on one, I don't care if it's in practice, I don't care if it's in a meet, whatever. If you did that, I'd take you wherever you wanted to go to eat. I'd take you to the finest restaurant. I'll take you to see. I don't care. I don't care where it is. Because I'm not above bribery. Do you know what happened yesterday? That quiz team, it was their second practice. They had a round. Or they were two questions away from everyone quizzing out. What are you sowing? 
And then what is, what is it that you're going to reap out of it? If you want to harvest good things in your life, you've got to plant good things. Say that again. If you want to harvest good things, for you, you've got to plant good things. And if you don't know what that even means, I mean, you're struggling right now, then you've got to get a brother or sister. And you've got to say, Pastor, I've been talking about this discipleship thing for so long. I don't even know what it means. I don't know how to get into this. All I know is I keep butting my head up against the wall, and it seems like I just can't ever get ahead. And I want good things to happen but I don't have good things happening in my life, would you join me on this journey? And, and folks, i got to tell you, if anyone asks you that question, you better say yes. It's, it's dangerous stuff to be a disciple and to make disciples. But that is a harvest worth having. That is something that will last from here to the eternity with Jesus. And folks, if you're one of those people who says, uh, I don't even know what Pastor's been talking about this whole thing. It sounds cool. I mean, it sounds good. I, I want good things. Would you be bold enough? To maybe look across this sanctuary, or maybe you already have in your head somebody that you kind of look up to in this church because they seem to have it all together. Well, number one, I'm going to tell you they don't because none of it too. But if you seem that way, would you just be bold enough to get in contact with them and say, I need someone. I need someone to, to plant some good things in me because I want to I want to have a good harvest. And I don't know what to plant right now. Would you be bold enough to ask someone to disciple you? And for those of you who be asked, would you be bold enough to say, yeah, I'll take that responsibility. I will begin an intentional relationship with you and we'll walk through this life together because with Christ, we can do anything. And never forget, folks, if you're in that relationship or you've been asked to be in that relationship, you need someone pouring into you. It's good to pour into other people. It's good to study and walk a journey with them. And, and of course, it feels great for us when we have some answers in this crazy world. And we can say, this is how it works for me. But would you know, too, that you need someone pouring into you? I try to tell my kids all the time, uh, whether it's my daughter with her singing or marching band or my son on the drums or whatever, you guys are amazing. You have this, this incredible natural talent. But there's always someone better. Find them. Have them pour into you, and it'll make you better. If you want to do this for the rest of your life, you want to play junk, you want to be a musician, find that person and just start that journey with them. Learn everything they could teach you. And it's the same folks with our journey, our spiritual journey. Find someone who's been through a lot, who relies on God, who is a anchor in prayer and invite him on a journey with you. I want you to stand and let's just close our service by praying about that. These relationships that God has been calling to us for so long about, uh, a discipleship relationship. We've been talking about it in these few letters from Paul. What it means to be a disciple, the lifestyle that we are to live. But let's take some action. Father God, we come before you this morning and we thank you for your word and uh, and I just thank you for your courage and strength that you put into me that I could I could just be honest with the, the folks about some of the things about what it means to be a pastor. And I pray right now, God, for this church, for those who are here, for those who are not here, for our ladies that are at uh, their retreat who have been having such a, an amazing time. I pray for all of us, God, Pray for revival to happen in your church. And in that prayer, God, we know that if we're going to be revived, we need someone pouring into us. So I pray right now, maybe you've already been talking to us about it, God, and we've just been trying to shoo you away. I pray right now that you would begin uh, 
a, a relationship, if it's not already there, God, a relationship with us and someone else where we could be on this journey together. Yes, we're part of a, a great big family here at Pasco Nash, but the intimacy of a discipleship relationship, just one and another, working with each other, sharpening iron on iron, making each other better, holding each other accountable, praying for each other in ways that isn't happening anywhere else. I pray, God, that you would put us together in these relationships, that you would draw these relationships, these two people close together and make it very clear to them. I pray in doing this, God, that you would refine us, that you would restore us to your original design that you have for humanity and for each one of us specifically, God, that you would awaken with us a great purpose to praise you with all that we are help build your kingdom for the betterment of those around us. May you move among your people, God. And may you sanctify us through and through, setting us apart to do your good work. We pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Folks, would you connect with somebody before you leave today and share a word of encouragement with them, okay? You're dismissed. Have a wonderful day.